Um, also, we have our next host here. So let me introduce our next host, and then I will let him introduce our next speaker. Hello. Hello. How's everything? You good? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I'm perfect. Uh, it's not the middle of the night for me. It's just 8, 9 p.m., but I'm very excited to be here. Um, uh, this is something I ever wanted. I had pajamas, you know, uh, being able to host a session during the middle of the night for some folks or or very early in the morning for other people in the around the world. So thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, that's really cool. So I will let you uh, introduce our speaker and I will just slowly move away. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Sure. <laughs> so our next speaker, Ronnie Dover, uh, he's going to come. He, 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 they're going to be talking about observability. You know, um, Ronnie, welcome. Happy to have you here. Hi, great to be here. Yeah. So uh, whenever you're ready for your presentation, let me know and I will just uh, leave the stage for you. I'm definitely ready. Okay, so uh, good luck. And again, thank you very much. Uh, see you in a moment. Thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm extremely excited to be speaking about what's become kind of my favorite topic, which is open telemetry and continuous feedback and other topics. And the reason I'm so excited to be speaking about it is, I think, because uh, there are such few uh, times where you can see how technology can really make an impact on how we write code to the extent that it changes it. You know, I've seen that happen with testing, um, with async development. You know, there, there are these concepts where you can see they start seeping in and eventually, you know, everybody's coding a little differently. And I feel that these specific technologies have the potential to do quite the same thing. And I hope that by the end of the presentation, you'll kind of agree with me uh, on the potential at least. So let's get started. So just about me, um, I've been a developer for over 20 years. I've also been a product manager and kind of oscillated between these two extremes. Uh, it's been very hard for me to write code without caring about the why and the requirements. And it's been equally hard to worry about user stories without getting my hands dirty and actually writing code. So eventually, I managed to somehow resolve that uh, inner conflict. Um, but in, from both these kind of ends, uh, I've seen and have been obsessed with how do we actually improve the development process? And how can we, and I'm, I'm very kind of skeptical and evidence-based in my approach in seeing, okay, what works, what doesn't, which parts of Agile work, which parts of other technologies work, how can we make things better? And it was throughout that journey uh, that I stumbled into a little issue, I think, with some of the dev process that we use today that I want to share with you. And... Um, kind of show how it, I think it leads up to more observability as, as a very important kind of cornerstone of development. So to illustrate that, I'm going to go through kind of a story uh, of a developer in my team called Bill, a very hypothetical developer. Um, Bill is really, you know, top-notch, best developer in the team. He's been um, doing it for a while. And he's been tasked with something very simple that I think we've all been tasked um, doing in the past, which is take this feature, develop it, and then get it all the way to production. And over the year, Bill's job kind of shifted, right? Because you know, I remember when I got started about you know 20 years ago, um, creating a feature actually meant developing it. So you know, you would finish developing it, you would wrap it up real nicely. And then you would hand it over to the guys across the hall from the QA team, and they, they would take a look at it. There would be some philosophical arguments ensuing about what's a feature, what's a bug. But eventually, the feature would roll on, and you would forget about it, except if it has a bug or something, and then you'd, you might be hearing about that feature again. But that was where your involvement ended. And of course, that's no longer the case. It hasn't been for a while. So today, developers are owning the feature. So they're owning unit tests. Um, they're responsible to make it maintainable, to make it something that um, can be scaled later on. They even know how to deploy it oftentimes. So they understand Helm charts and Terraform and other technologies to allow taking features all the way to production. And Bill has been the same way. 
So today when Bill rolls out a feature, he's again, top notch of a developer. He's doing everything right. The GitOps process, test, actions, everything. But the question remains, what happens then? What does Bill have to do a minute after he clicked that button to merge the pull request, everything, you know, continuous deployment kicked in, everything is in production. What should he do next? And the truth of the matter is that 99% of the time, despite my best efforts and, you know, my, my expectation of Bill was check if, if your code works, you know, it does it work well. Is anyone using it? Did it change anything? You, you merge this fix into this very important data access layer component. Did it improve things for everyone? Are things slower now? Um, I've seen meticulously written code being pushed to production and we would only discover like months later that it was one bad if statement away from actually getting executed. Just because somebody, you know, made a mistake and nobody checked. So what I want to happen is for Bill to own his feature all the way to production. But 99% of the times, what would happen is that Bill would just move on to the next story. And this I've seen repeated across multiple teams and multiple you know, companies that I've worked with. Um, and it kind of made me think about the fact that we have this concept of, of this infinite loop where things are being built and then integrated and then deployed and then operated upon. And, and we have so many tools. This, this is just a random pick I got grabbed online. You'll find numerous examples of, of the same kind of diagram. But I challenge you to see, you know, there, there is something missing here in this diagram. Um, and if you look real closely, you'll see that each of the stages that are in this diagram have multiple tools associated with them, except for one. So for some reason, continuous feedback um, seems to be a really important part, right? It's, it's what's supposed to bring all of these insights back from production to development has only one tool associated with it. And that's Salesforce for some reason that I still haven't figured out. But the important thing is that there is a kind of a big gap here in the DevOps loop. And this gap is not theoretical. It is something that I see every day. Developers are moving on to the next feature. There is no kind of continuous ownership of the feature as we shift right um, beyond testing, beyond deployment and into, okay, so how does this work in production? Did it actually make things better for everyone or not? And this is very indicative of the way our feedback or the feedback that we have uh, is in general. So, you know, we have great feedback when we code. The IDE has tons of features and, and, and watches and uh, breakpoints and, and all of those things. We have, I would say, so-so feedback when we're running tests because it's, it's just yes or no questions. Um, is, you know, did the test pass or fail? Less qualitative, if you will. But it's still feedback. And yet we have almost no feedback from production environments. And this led me to think, again, both as a product owner and as a developer, well, if only, if only we had more access or access to instant objective data about our code and how it worked and being very evidence-based in how I thought, I thought well, yeah, this would be ideal if, if I could say to, uh, Mr. Bill, look, here is the data, and, and, and that's it. And, and then he would be able to use it. And that's the perfect segue to talk about open telemetry and why I think it's very significant. So open telemetry is a lot of things. I don't think it's groundbreaking in particular. It's not a completely new technology that reinvented the wheel or anything like that. But still, I think it is one of the most important technologies we have today. And the reason for that is that everyone agrees on it. And that could not be overstated. So the fact that there is a consensus about a single observability technology that is both open source, open standard in terms of anybody can take a look at it. And open telemetry is just a spec to tell us about how uh, to, to, to take measurements of how the code works and take traces and take logs and things like that 
has just led to two very important consequences. The first, as you would get with any open technology that becomes widespread in the market, you start getting an ecosystem. So suddenly it's not just the vendors or the kind of proprietary technologies that can provide value add tools, everybody can. So suddenly there's this entire ecosystem of, well, there's this data and here are 10 or 20 open source tools that can help make that data more valuable. The other aspect is that because you don't need to kind of split your effort between the Splunk way of doing things and the Datadog one or the New Relic one or the App Dynamics. I'm trying to keep track of everyone and not, um, um, and, and be fair to all of the observability um, IPMs out there. But because you don't need to worry about supporting each and every one of them, it just becomes very easy to incorporate support for Altel in your platform. And that's exactly what happened. So today we're at a situation where I think there is this unprecedented coverage and no matter the tool that you're using and no matter if you're using, let's say in Python, if you're using Flask or if you're using a fast API or if you're using Django, it doesn't matter kind of the database or queuing or other platforms that you're using, most of them are going to have built-in support for open telemetry just because it's, very, it's a very easy decision to make as a project maintainer to include support and instrumentation for it, or just for somebody to go out and develop a package that um, supports that. So to illustrate that, I've created a sample solution and you can find that in this link. Um, I was, I had two goals in my sample solution. First, I'm kind of allergic to these CRUD apps that are very, very thin, you know, paper thin and non-realistic where you just, you know, um, have create, update, delete, and, and that's it, that's the app. Um, and I thought observability to really illustrate the value needs to be something deeper. So I created kind of a fake API uh, for the Gringotts vaults from the Harry, uh, Harry Potter Wizarding World, for, the, for those of you who are familiar with it. Uh, the reason is I was watching the movies with my kids at the time. Um, and throughout making that uh, application, I challenged myself to see, well, I'm making a completely new application. I'm going to use Fast API, Rabbit, Postgres, some worker service, maybe some uh, related packages. Let's see how easy it is to indeed take all of that information out of the application uh, without spending a lot of time rewriting the code. And my goal was how can I, as Bill again, get complete visibility into what's going on? And maybe for that, we can just take a moment to just explain these two basic concepts around tracing, which is a big part of what Open Telemetry offers us. So a trace, for those of you not familiar with it, is basically a flow that goes through the system. If the user hits the API, then a message goes into the queue, then the service does something that uses Postgres and maybe some external API, that entire request flow is considered a trace. And then within each kind of segment, you can break down each individual activity, and that's called a span. And my challenge was, well, how can I get these traces and spans information about this entire application, we'll see that in a sec, um, without making too many modifications to the code. And it so happened that almost each and every one of the technologies I was using in this particular project already had support for open telemetry, and it's not by chance. It's kind of, as I mentioned, the, the, the situation. And as a result, with fast API, I got fast instrumentation working. Uh, RabbitMQ, I used Pika, for those of you who are familiar with it. So I got Pika instrumentation. And all of these instrumentations, are, and I'll show you that in a sec, are pr pretty much just type instrumentation.enable, and that's it. And, and you have data. Um, and there's ways to, make, to even make that automatic. But once I've activated all of these data points that you see here, without making almost any code changes, I my situation as Bill, the developer, changed from having zero visibility into what's happening with my code in production to having, you could say, too much visibility or too much data about how my code works in production. And because we also have some awesome 
open source tools, uh, visualizing and seeing that also became very, very easy. Now, this is a very short session. I don't have a lot of time to go into the class. Let's try to do something. So um, as I mentioned, um, getting all of that information out is very simple. You can kind of see here uh, the different instrument instrumentations I use that are just packages that are part of PyPy. And I just added these packages. And then you just add, let's say, for logging, for request, for fast API, for each of them. You just call the instrument um, API, and that's it. And basically, it's already sending out data. Um, and Open Telemetry also comes with a very easy way to configure where to send that data to, um, how, do you, how, how do you call this kind of source where you're getting the data information out. In this case, it's the Vault service. And then configuring a lot of other things that um, really there's, there's great documentation on. And I don't, I don't think I have a lot to add about, except to say that it's extremely simple. Um, so once, I've done, once you've done all of that, you can get to the situation. And here, here is the, the API uh, that we're using. And let's uh, I don't know, trigger something here. Um, so let's, for example, trigger an, trigger an appraisal, which basically means that I'll send a goblin work to look for what's going on with a specific um, vault. Oh, I need to authenticate first. So let's do that. Perfect. And now let's execute that. And now one of the nice and awesome open source tools that we have available is called Jaeger. And that's a great way to visualize the traces. Very easy to get a standalone Jaeger just from Docker or just to install it. Um, so uh, no trouble there. Um, and let's see what are the latest traces that Jaeger picked up uh, about my service. And immediately I can see my appraisal fault, uh, um, sorry, flow uh, or trace. And I can see that there are two services involved, the vault service and the goblin worker that already kind of picked up uh, the workload. And as you can see, it's very easy to get access into exactly what happened there. Uh, all of this information, again, was provided just by merit of enabling these automated um, kind of instrumentation packages. So immediately I can see kind of the, the, the specific DB statements that, uh, that are going on here. I can see um, the, um, the specific API calls. And I can also see any logical uh, instrumentations that I added to define spans. For example, I can take a specific area in the code and say, well, this particular area does X, Y, Z. Um, let's take an example. So let's say here I'm saying, OK, this is a span. I call it authenticate vault owner and key. And from that moment on, it's kind of logs on steroids that uh, the application will monitor exactly what's going on with there. Uh, when it started, when it ended, who called it, a lot of contextual information that's missing from logs to provide me this a very easy way to access what's going on with my code um, and what does a typical flow look like and all of that really important information. And all of that is great. Um, and it led me to think that, well, there is even more we can do with all of that information than just validate our changes after where, um, you know, we've rolled them into production. So if you think about it, um, even before, you know, this is a loop, right? So even before uh, Bill got started on, on writing the feature, he could ask important questions. Uh, what is the concurrency around this code? Is it even being used? Am I over-optimizing here? Are there any issues I should know about? Maybe I'm going to fix some more bugs while I'm at it. What can you tell me about how it's being used now? And then before I code review it, again, I can ask a lot of really important questions to be able to plan out my changes better, review and evaluate my changes better. And then, as we said before, kind of um, understand what my changes did after I rolled them into production. So as you can see, this can have a very profound effect into how we develop code. So the question is, why is it not happening yet? And if I were to ask you, well, is that enough? If I gave you this information, would it change the way you code? And most of you would say, well, no, that sounds like a lot of work, which is exactly what I've heard from developers around um, 
why they're not using it more. Because I've been pushing my developers to uh, use as much data as possible. And they came back with the answer, well, it's kind of hard. So let's explore that for a second. Why is that so hard? Why is it so difficult to do to, to practice continuous feedback? Well, the first um, difficulty is around expertise. So I just showed you a single flow going through the system, and that's interesting enough. But think about a production system where there are you know, potentially hundreds of thousands, if not millions of flows a day how do we actually assess what's going on there? And that requires statistics and other kind of uh, know-hows that we as developers don't always remember at the top of our heads. And I, it's not by chance that I put here a, a, you know, a picture related to house repairs, because for me, that's my blind spot. I'm terrible at it. it and, and I would procrastinate as much as possible anything that has to do with house repairs. And it, for exactly the same reasons, many developers would kind of push aside any task that has to do uh, remastering uh, Statistics 101 or understanding what's P95 or how to remove outliers or doing any types of analysis. The other aspect is that developers are very focused on one thing, and that is code. And if I need to context switch and kind of look around in other places, I'm kind of distracting myself from the main area where I feel productive. The next reason is that it's very reactive to kind of go around dashboards looking for trouble or fishing for trouble. And I think that's very interesting because I think the secret is maybe in the name. Um, the name is continuous feedback. That means that it needs to be continuous, right? Just like with tests, we don't actually need to stop and think, well, I'm going to run my test now. It needs to be continuous integration, right? And we, with continuous deployment, we don't consciously decide to roll out into production. It happens as a part of the pipeline we designed. C feedback needs to arrive continuously and as a part of my work, it doesn't need to be something I'm seeking out. Otherwise, none of us will, and none of us do. And this is where kind of my own personal journey with continuous feedback started. And I was thinking, well, I'm convinced. I think that this is really amazing data. And by the way, why do I know that this is amazing data? It's because developers do use it when things go wrong, when production is on fire, when the fire brigade goes out to fix an issue, we find out amazing troves of, insurmountable troves of amazing things and, and, and the data yields so many, you know, huge world mind-bending mind insights about the code. Oh my God, why is this slow? Why is this calling this? Is this loop uh, always existed? Um, how, come, how come I never noticed this before, right? So, my goal was how can we, knowing that there's so much information there, how can we make that information something that makes an impact on that? And to do that, this is my own personal journey has been to create a project called Digma, which allows to analyze that data and make it a part of the dev cycle. And I'm very fortunate to have seen other tools do it as well. So I think the entire industry is going into this area or new uncharted area where developers are kind of breaking the wall between the design time that they're working in and, and how production runtime uh, works at using observability. So to illustrate that, I just wanna show you a quick glimpse, not because I want you to uh, specifically uh, use Digma. There are really many other great tools that allow to do that. I just want to show you kind of the vision of what I think future development is. So here is that same, and this is, by the way, why I'm excited about it, because I think development is changing. So here's the code for that uh, API that I just showed you. And, every, and all I'm going to do now is just enable something in my IDE that will uh, query a backend, uh, Digma's backend, that just continuously analyzes all of that data that already exists, right? So I'm going to look at the same code again, only this time from kind of a new um, um, new spectacles, right? Uh, and immediately I see st stuff, right? This is very slow. There is uh, 
not a lot of usage, but there is an N plus one uh, query that was identified. And it becomes kind of a part of my work. I can see that this endpoint is slow. I can see, well, how much traffic does it see? I can see the bottlenecks and I can find out that there is a specific problem with a query here that I should worry about or a specific problem with a bottleneck. And all of these, this is information that becomes kind of instantly a part of what I'm doing. And if I need to see a trace or to go kind of deeper to understand exactly what's going on there, I can see that in context. And that's kind of the beauty of, uh, of what this type of capability provides us. Um, and this is how I finally am able to see Bill, as well as the other developers, start leveraging observability by making it a part of their world and a part of their code. So how do you get started? So um, I created this um, um, domain, continuousfeedback.org, and currently it's hosting a link with some resources that, I'm sorry, some resources that I found uh, useful that are mentioned in this talk and that you can start using as well, like Jaeger and OpenTelemetry and others, um, just to get started with continuous feedback and adopting these types of practices. And then more um, uh, from an approach point of view, I think that the biggest part of what the, of, of the transformation that, that we're all going through is ownership. So, and I'm seeing kind of the same shift that we used to see with testing where people were kind of kicking back uh, or pushing back on, on the fact that they need to also test their, their code and, you know, why is this my responsibility and so on. And in a similar way, this is changing now with production. So owning the code all the way to production, um, use the tools, harvest the data that's there, implement the feedback into the dev process, introduce into your Scrum, have a, a weekly feedback meeting to see what do we know about the features that we rolled out? What do we need to know? Um, and of course, you're welcome to reach out and join the thinking. This is a completely new area. Uh, there's lots of people who are active there and I'm, I'm extremely, happy to see it's coming alive. So please feel free to reach out to me as well. My contact details are also in this link. Um, be very happy to hear from you. That's it. Thanks for having me um, on this uh, opportunity to talk in, uh, uh, in pajamas. And uh, hopefully have everyone ha continue to have a great night full of Python and code. It was a great presentation, Ronnie. I hope you all, everyone that is watching this live or anyone that is watching the recording later, take notes because there's a lot of content in only 27 minutes. Uh, Ronnie, again, thank you very much for the for being with us. And uh, I don't see, uh, I see a question. Uh, I have a question for you. What is the most yeah. important thing in observability? The most important thing? Yes. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I'm not just saying that. I've, I've, I've talked to organizations, to people who, who did amazing things with, with observability. I've seen LCDs in the halls full of dashboards. And then I asked the person, well, are your developers using it? And they say, well, no, they think it's a good thing. And, and that's, that's true. It's true. If we, we take, we, there is a lot of data. The, the secret is being, is, is being able to use it. Exactly. We don't do anything with data if we don't actually do anything with it. Uh, so I don't see any more questions. Anything you want to say before closing? No, no. Thanks for the opportunity. And I'm always happy to talk more and uh, hope, hope the resources will also uh, help everyone. Yeah, we're very happy with your presentation. And folks, uh, please continue. Uh, our next speaker is going to be here in a, in a couple of minutes. Ronnie, uh, thank you again.